gentlemen, welcome to Jewish Book Week. My name is Claudia Rubenstein and I'm the festival director. I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to um, a panel discussion on a fantastic new volume called Insiders, Outsiders, Refugees from Nazi Europe and their contribution to British culture. This volume is part of a nationwide year-long festival that's been uh, spearheaded by Monica Bonduchen. Monica is um, an independent London-based art historian, curator, and writer. Um, and uh, the institutions that she's worked for include the, the, uh, the Tate Gallery, the Royal Academy of Arts, Sotheby's, and the Courtauld Institute. Um, Monica will be introducing her uh, fellow speakers, Anna Nyberg and Daniel Smoman, but a little bit of housekeeping. As you exit the hall, you'll see the most beautiful volume, and um, Monica, Daniel, and Anna will all be delighted to sign if you'd like to buy a copy. Thank you very much, and welcome. Claudia, and it's wonderful to see, albeit in the, the dark, so many people gathered here today. Um, I will just say very briefly that we weren't sure that the book would be ready in time for this year's Jewish Book Week, and hence we didn't appear in the brochure, and at the last minute a slot became available, and I'm very, very grateful and delighted that Jewish Book Week has made it possible for us to be here today. What I would like to do, if I may, is to start by, they've done it for me, saying a little bit about the festival of which the book is an integral part. As Claudia has uh, briefly outlined, I'm an art historian by profession, a freelance art historian based here in London. And um, I'll start, actually, I'll start, start on a very personal note. Why not? We're among friends here. My background predisposes me, emotionally speaking, to be interested in the topic of the festival, namely the contribution to this country's culture of those who found sanctuary here from Nazi-dominated Europe. My mother sadly can't be with us today, although she is still very much with us, 94, coming on for 95, Dorothy Bohm, wonderful photographer who came to this country as a girl of 14, going on 15. My father came from Poland, uh, my mother came in June 39, my father came in uh, on Kristallnacht, apparently, he travelled through, um, through Europe at the age of 18. And, well, I don't really, I think in this company, I don't have to say much more. So that's where I sort of start from deep, deep down, if you like. But professionally speaking, I've been struck for many a long year how often it's commented upon in the press, en passant, how great the contribution was to this country, not just in the visual arts, but across the board, on the part of those who came here in the 30s for the most part, but also, of course, after the war in smaller numbers, um, fleeing from, from the Third Reich and its dominions, if you like. And I thought, right, it's time to do something about this. Let's look at the phenomenon in a more nuanced, more detailed, more analytical sort of way. I started off with a small idea, actually. It was just a very local idea. Hampstead, where I was lucky enough to be born and bred, was, as some of you may know, absolutely uh, not the only centre, but it was a wonderfully creative hub for the kind of cultural interactions between those who came from Europe and those who welcomed them to these shores. And I started off with a small idea about well, almost exactly two years ago, uh, talking to Berghaus and Hampstead Museum, the curator there, and they've one of the you know, sort of initial partners of the whole project, with a view to organising an exhibition just about Hampstead. And in conversation with the curator, I suddenly realised it had the potential to become something much, much bigger. So fast forward two years on, I am absolutely astonished, almost overwhelmed, at the way it has grown. As Claudia has already indicated, it has become very large indeed. It is absolutely nationwide. If I say that there are events happening as far north as Stromness in Orkney, as far south as Chichester in Sussex, as far west as um, Penzance in, in Cornwall, and as far east as Kings Lynn, with of course London, plenty of things happening in London and all points in between. It is truly nationwide, which I'm very pleased about. It straddles all the arts, not just the visual arts, although the subject of this book is indeed primarily on the visual arts. Um, and it is indeed going on starting really this month right through to March 2020. And at this rate, I suspect there will be other things happening beyond it. There is um, a website. I don't want to go on too long. If you are interested in finding out more, I do, in fact, have some flyers. But also, it's very easy now to find out more about the range of events, exhibitions, concerts, dance performances, film screenings, educational events happening 
through this year. Um, it's www.insidersoutsidersfestival.org. I think I'll keep it to that. I, I could go on, but I, I won't, um, except to say that it is very much a tribute. It's a celebration of achievement of immense, almost disproportionate contribution across all the art forms. But, as I'm sure, again, in this company, I don't really have to remind you, there is, in all these success stories, there is a dark, they're very dark, backdrop of profound loss, dislocation, trauma, etc., etc. And I think that's actually very important to be aware of. I think these days it's very interesting because the success stories are so numerous for people who are rather ignorant of such matters to think, oh, it couldn't have been that hard for them at the beginning. But one of the things that's sort of embedded, if you like, in the very premises of the festival is to remind people that actually many obstacles to do with prejudice, professional jealousy, xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, yes, of course, had to be fought and surmounted. That's very, very important as well. It's not just about that generation, and there are not many, of course, left, alas, on the cusp of disappearing, but also the festival embraces the creative responses of the so-called second and even third generation, those who, in a sense, do battle, grapple creatively with the complex legacy of their parental stories. Yes, I don't actually have the exact statistic, I don't know if Daniel perhaps knows this, but I would suggest that at least 90% of the creative individuals being paid tribute to in the Insiders Outsiders Festival are, were Jewish for obvious historical reasons, but there were those who were not. And I think, again, looking at all this in a more nuanced sort of way, one needs to be aware, for example, that Walter Gropius, one of the great, you know, the Bauhaus architects, and as I'm sure Anna will be telling us more about, this year serendipitously is the 80th, oh sorry, the centenary of the founding of the German, profoundly influential German art and design school, the Bauhaus. But Gropius, for example, and another example might be Rudolf Laban, the very, very important dancer choreographer. They were willing to accommodate with the Nazi regime in the first instance. Who are we to judge? I will leave that one to you to think about. Uh, when push came to shove, of course, their modernist way of making art made them fall from grace with a vengeance in the Nazi period, and they decided to leave. That's kind of one strand that one might, I think, need to take heed of. On a more positive note, there are people, for example, like Ferdinand Rauter, and I don't know if Claire, of uh, Andre, his daughter, it happens to be in the audience today. Um, uh, Ferdinand Rauter was a musician, a composer, and a teacher, and he could have stayed, he was not Jewish, he could have stayed, and there's a lovely story, perhaps apocryphal, but I like to quote it. Apparently, when he was asked to work for the Nazi regime, he said, well, actually, I'm booked up until the end of the Third Reich. <laughs> I, you know, th those stories also need to be, need to be acknowledged. Um, all right, what else? Women, gender, something I think we can perhaps touch on uh, in our conversation and or in the questions. Um, I'm very delighted as a woman, as a feminist, that it didn't come with any difficulty to make sure that there are an unusually large number of women practitioners represented in this festival. Uh, there are big names and for the most part, the big names aren't women. I think you know, one has to acknowledge that. But part of the uh, impetus behind the festival is indeed to bring the lesser-known figures back into the public eye, and I'm very delighted that so many of them are indeed female. <laughs> the legacy, the contemporary relevance, these are all things we can talk about, but uh, perhaps I should end by saying that I have no illusions, really, that one reason, perhaps the overriding reason why the festival has taken off to the extent that it has, and there are over a hundred events already in place for the coming year, is because it seems very timely. Timely is the adjective that everybody seems to be using. In a way, it's very sad, isn't it, that it is so timely, but at this time of deep and bitter debates over Britain's relationship to Europe, the B word needs to be said, I suppose, you know, with ever, ever sort of <laughs> com more complicated issues are uh, sort of raising their heads there. But of course, also the concomitant uh, rise of racism generally and anti Semitism much more specifically. It does seem to be entirely fitting that we take pause here, we look at that generation as a kind of proof, if you like, if proof be needed, that refugees. Immigrants can and do make a huge, immense contribution to this country. <laughs>
Thank you. What I'd like to do now is introduce my colleague here, Daniel. Actually, no, I'm sorry, I mustn't forget that there are others. We've got three here, three people on the stage. But what I'd like to do, because there are actually 23 contributors to the anthology, what I will now do is move past the cover. It seems to me a book is an essential part of this project. It lasts, events are ephemeral. Because the visual arts is where I stand, you know, it's my comfort zone, I felt it perhaps most appropriate to focus on the visual arts for this particular publication. I will say for those of you who are interested in other uh, terrain that there's going to be, for example, almost certainly a special issue of um, 20th Century Music magazine devoted to the subject in the field of music. There's going to be uh, a special issue of the Dance Research Journal, again, focusing on dance. And also there's another journal called Jewish Film and New Media, which is going to is planning a special issue on that. So in other words, the other um, fields will be be represented in, in a longer term sort of way. Let me though, before I hand over to Daniel, just quickly run through, if I may, the, um, the contents. I'll keep it as brief as I can, but just to give you some sense of the range and scope of this volume. And I, again, I'm sorry, I can't actually see from here, but I think I'm right in saying that several uh, other contributors are here in the audience today. I certainly hope they are, and it would be nice perhaps to rope them in or to sort of introduce you to them if the occasion arises. So let me just quickly run through this. First of all, we have a forward by Sir Norman Rosenthal, a very personal forward. I'll leave it at that. Then comes an introduction by Daniel Sloman here, um, whom I'll say more about in, in a minute, setting the scene. The first section is called Emigre Contributions to the Visual Arts. I start off with a kind of survey essay on painting and sculpture. There follows an essay by Alan Powers, the architectural historian, on the contribution of the emigre architects, of course. Anna Nyberg, our third participant tonight, has written the next essay on the emigre designers. Michael Berkowitz has written on the photographers. Then comes some rather more focused material uh, in, an ex uh, in a, a section called Art, Education and Scholarship. Sarah McDougall of the Ben Uri Gallery. And I will say straight away before I forget that I'm immensely grateful both to the Ben Uri Gallery and also to David Herman, Joseph Herman's son, who I think is here in the audience, for allowing us to use this wonderful image. I hope you'll all agree. I think you'll agree that it's immensely powerful, it's vivid, it's colourful, it's emotionally intense. Um, they've given us permission to use it, not just for the cover of the book, but also as a kind of signature, almost like a light motif, a key image for the festival as a whole. It's called Refugees. It is quite historically specific, done in 1941 when he finds sanctuary in Glasgow. Um, via He comes from Poland via um, Brussels. But of course, it is universal, I think, in that sense of evoking the fear, the terror, the anguish of having to flee. So that's Sarah McDougall writing about the art teachers or the emigres as art teachers. We then have somebody with a wonderfully unpronounceable German name who's not uh, with us today, Svanche Kufus Wickenheiser, who is absolutely the expert in the world um, on the Riemann School. And if you've never heard of it, I won't be surprised. Anna here will be saying more. And I'm also very grateful to Anna for having done the, uh, the challenging job of translating the, the text from, from the German. We then have Hans Christian Hernes, who I do believe is here in the audience, talking about the emigre art historians. Art history didn't really exist as an academic discipline until the emigres appeared on our shores. Moena Blut, who I think is also here tonight, talking about the picture restorers. Some of the most eminent picture restorers in this country were indeed emigres. We then have a section, section three, on the publishers, the dealers and the collectors. Anna again has written a book, um, We'll hear more about it later on the Emigre Art Publishers, so she's um, responsible for that chapter. Amanda Hopkinson has written about Picture Post, the pioneering photojournalistic magazine founded by a Hungarian Jewish refugee. Richard Aronovitz of Sotheby's, together with Shauna Isaac, has written about the art collectors and dealers. Simon Lake, curator at the New Walk Art Gallery in Leicester, and if you don't know it, I urge you to go up there and take a look. It has probably the most important collection of early... 20th century German art in this country, and most people don't know about it at all. It also has a very poignant story behind it. Then uh, section four, places of internment, creativity, and sanctuary. Rachel Dixon, also of the Ben Uri, writing about the creative life of the British internment camps. Again, a much neglected topic. Uh, 
I've written a piece on Hampstead. I've already talked about my Hampstead connection in that section. And Leila de Belge has written a piece on the Isacon building, the Lawn Road Flats, which is indeed the subject of a separate book, which is also just coming out as we speak. Section five is on what we've called the key supporters, because let's not forget that many of these important figures wouldn't have thrived had it not been for the goodwill and indeed the practical support of many non-Jewish, British-born individuals here on the ground. So, for example, we have Tony Penrose, the son of um, Roland Penrose, talking about Roland Penrose's crucial role in all this. Michael Paroskos, writing about Herbert Reed, who crops up almost everywhere. We then have Anna Müller-Herlin from Berlin, writing about Diana and Fred Ullman, another important pair of supporters. He was an, an emigre, she was a British aristocrat. And uh, last but not least in that section, by Andrew Chandler, an essay on George Bell, Bishop of Chichester. Also very interesting. And lastly, chapter, uh, section six, we've called Patriotism and Group Identities. The uh, next chapter, therefore, is by Charmin Brinson, and it's about the contribution of German-speaking, mostly German-speaking, mostly Jewish refugees to British wartime propaganda. Again, a neglected and fascinating topic. Then we have um, a long essay by Keith Holtz, who's based in, in, in Illinois. Um, it's an institute, called it a brief institutional history of German and Austrian exile artist groups, kind of self-help, if you like, organisations. And last but not least, Harriet Atkinson of the University of Brighton, writing about the really quite disproportionately important role played by the emigres who only a few years late, earlier had been interned as so-called enemy aliens in the 1951 Festival of Britain. So it kind of seems a good moment to stop there. Right, enough by way of introduction. Let me now hand over to Daniel, but just before I do say a few words about him. He's, a, some of you, many of you may know, a social and cultural historian, born in London, educated in uh, Cambridge and Cornell, a lecturer at the University of Sussex for quite a while, and then went on to work um, extensively in BBC Radio. Uh, he's a senior research um, fellow at the Institute of Historical Research, the University of London, since 2004. He's published widely, but the book that's really relevant here, which some of you may have read, which really kind of set the tone for a further ex you know, exploration of the topic, is called The Hitler Emigres, and subtitled The Cultural Impact on Britain of Refugees from Nazism. It was first published, I think I'm right in saying, in 2002, and um, has been reprinted in paperback since, so I highly recommend that. But it doesn't, of course, focus on the visual arts primarily or exclusively. Let me perhaps just say a little bit more about um, Anna before I hand over properly. Anna Nyberg is an honorary uh, lecturer at Imperial College, University of London, where she's taught German, French and Italian for 30 years or so. Uh, based on her PhD, her wonderful book called Emigres, The Transformation of Art Publishing in Britain was published by Feiden in 2014. She's a committee member of a very interesting group called the Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies based at the University of London. And uh, very recently, in 2017, she, together with director Robert Sternberg, uh, produced the film Refuge Britain, Stories of Emigre Designers, which we has been shown, but we hope to show it again in the course of the year-long festival. Thank you very much, and over to Daniel. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Monica. Um, yes, I did indeed used to work at the BBC at one time, and the first thing we always checked was that your, uh, the microphone is working, it's audible, you can hear me. I'll talk for about 10 minutes or so, a little more. To try and put this whole thing in the wider historical context, as Monica said, the festival, and particularly this uh, wonderful Lung Humphreys book, in, has a very great deal of material about the visual culture in particular, but I want to talk about something about the wider cultural migration from pre-Nazi Central Europe to Britain and all the various art forms and other things uh, that, that uh, my generation and your generation have in a way benefited from. I should say at the outset that despite my, my funny name, I'm not a German Schneemann, <laughs> So I'm not really part of what it is we're talking about here. Um, I don't know where my lot came from. Originally, the Russian Pale in the previous migration of the 1880s and, uh, and 90s, and it was probably uh, 
a Polish you know, or something, which the immigration officer turned into snowman. But I was brought up in northwest London. And I remember that uh, we'd go away on holiday and my dad would have under his arm the latest volume of The Buildings of England, uh, designed by, uh, written by somebody mysteriously called Nikolaus Pevsner. Um, and I didn't really know about art, and I confused Renoir and Rubens and Raphael and so on. And so I'd have to go to the art bookshelves to find out who they all were. And there was a book there called The Story of Art by somebody called Gombrich. And I gradually grew up thinking that anybody called Schmidt must be 10% cleverer than anybody called Smith. You know, they would take me to concerts. I love music and I've written about opera and so on. And the conductor's name was always either jolly good English chap, it was probably Bolt or Sergeant or Beecham. Or it might well have been Rudolf Schwarz or Otto Klemperer or, uh, and so on. And I began to know that there was something that they all, all these people with these German names had in common that I ought to know more about. Uh, the Amadeus Quartet was launching itself in the, in the later 40s, three of the members of whom were refugees from Central Europe. And so when I started to try and put all this together, I realised I was not just talking about lots of celebs, wonderful people who contributed massively to the culture of the world that I was lucky enough to grow up in, but that they were, they were a, a wave of migration and that all waves of migration bring something of their culture with them. Think back to the Huguenots, or the Normans, or earlier still, Anglo-Saxons, and so on. And presumably the people today will bring something of the world that they have come from, which will intermix with what is here. And in the case of the people we're talking about here, it seemed to me, the more I thought about it, that you couldn't really understand the contribution of the refugees from Nazism, the Hitler emigres, unless you knew something about the pre-Nazi culture that many of them were bringing with them. So you need to know something about the Vienna of Freud and Mahler and Klimt and the secession. You need to know something about the culture of what we loosely call the Weimar period kind of period between the end of the First World War and the advent of the Nazis, the 1920s essentially. Um, <clears throat> the crudery, the rudery, the modernism, modern with a capital M. Think of, uh, some, of the, some of the painters, think of some of the architects, artists. We've already had reference to Gropius, uh, for example, and the Bauhaus. Um, and they were bringing something of this perhaps sometimes harsh, modern, modernist art, culture, music, literature, uh, um, uh, cartoons, to a Britain in the later 1930s, when, as Monica said, most of them arrived, which was culturally, you know, you might say imperial, you might say um, uh, insulated from Europe, you might also say it was in some ways neo-pastoral, Rus in Urbe, garden cities, um, Lutyens reviving Tudebethan type beautiful old architecture, roses around the door, perhaps even thatch, Vaughan Williams writing, uh, you know, variations on, on green sleeves or, or, or music of some of the Elizabethan composers. Very much, I remember as a kid, the, 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 the jigsaw puzzles Mummy and Daddy gave me were always little Bo Peep. They were always kind of rural, although we lived in a great big city called London. So the migrants from Central Europe brought something of a probably a more urban, more urbane, slightly harsher, perhaps more modernist, perhaps more industrialised culture to a Britain of um, oldie fashioned revival of a lovely oldie England that really had, had long gone. And, you know, Monica mentioned that, that you know, some of the art forms, I don't want to labour them to you, but um, one, I mean, think of the musicians, the, the, the composers. I've already mentioned a number of the, the um, uh, performers, three members of the Amadeus Quartet, uh, conductors like uh, Klemperer, 
Walter Goer, uh, Walter Suskind, and so on. Um, film. So many wonderful films produced by people like uh, Alexander Corder. Uh, Think of the Red Shoes uh, with uh, Anton Walbrook. Valbrück, uh, uh, as he was when he came here as, a, as an emigre from Central Europe. Dance, we've heard reference to Laban, Kurt Jules, modern dance, not just Giselle Swan Lake Nutcracker, but a new kind of modern capital M again at all times. Um, cultural entrepreneurs, people like Klaus Moser uh, or um, Victor Hochhauser, who brought so many musicians over to this, this country, Paul Hamlin put their money into the development of high culture. Um, the academic, you know, philosophers uh, like Popper, historians, not all refugees, some of them, Gombrich, um, Perutz, the, 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 the um, uh, biochemist, um, a number of them, Eric Hobsbawm, came here perhaps as students, perhaps to do a job, and gradually things were getting worse back home and they decided it would be better to stay here than go back to Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, wherever they had come from. As Monica quite rightly said, they weren't all, all Jewish. A great many were. But, uh, you know, Kurt Schwitters wasn't, Laban wasn't, Gropius wasn't, and so on. The founding fathers artistically of Blindborn. Fritz Busch, the conductor, Karl Eber, the director, they, they were people who, yes, they had tried to work in the new national socialist regime in Germany and they found it impossible. They too, like Hitler in a way, believed in the cultural tradition of old Germany of Bach and Beethoven and Goethe and Schiller and Heine and so on, but didn't like the fact they were being told, right, you can't have that violinist in your orchestra, he's Jewish, or so-and-so is homosexual, or so-and-so is Slavic, and therefore a kind of Trotskyite Marxist. They couldn't work in an environment like that. And they, to our benefit, came to Britain. A great, great many, of course, went to the United States. Some, like Gropius and other of the architects, came to Britain and then went on to the United States. Those who were Jewish, which I'm sure Monica's right, was the great majority, many of them were not self-consciously Jewish. The Jewish nurse, I mean, Gombrich used to say, you know, it's irrelevant to my art history whether I happen to have been born Jewish or not. That is a kind of ethnic, or in those days they would have said racial thing, more of interest to Hitler uh, or Goebbels than it is to me as an art historian. Um, <clears throat> I remember Klaus Moser, Lord Moser, saying to me, because I did a lot of interviews in those days with people who are now mostly gone, I have to say. He said, my father was a proud German. Iron Cross, you know, presented by the Kaiser from the Great War, and we were proud of the legacy of all the great German cultural figures that I, that I just listed. Um, and we thought that cultural nationalism by Germany, rather like cultural nationalism in Britain or Italy or emerging Irish culture was not a bad thing until it got abused cruelly, brutally, brutally, murderously by the Nazi regime. So they were Jewish, but that wasn't the prime reason, identity that many of them would have had, although they didn't particularly deny it either. I've sometimes tried to think back what it was overall. Can you generalise? anything about what it was they brought to the culture of this country. Remember, this country was not devoid of culture. I could have written a book about the culture of Britain over the last 70 or 80 years, and it would have been packed with Olivier and Gielgud and with um, uh, Hockney and, and Henry Moore and all sorts of wonderful people in all the arts, including wonderful musicians, you know, Simon Rattle or something. So they're not the only contributors to our culture. In the case of music, think of the music of Tippett or Benjamin Britten. So what did this particular group bring? Hard to generalise, and I'm tentative about this, but I sense a kind of professionalism. You know, when Schulte, George Schulte, took over at Covent Garden, he said he found it rather amateur. 
Oh, they love music and they used to sing it in delight and hope the audience loved it too. They lack the discipline of the professional. And he want, that's what he wanted to impose. And I sense that, you know, you look at the history of the Warburg Institute, the Warburg Institute that Gombrich headed, which what professionalized the study of art history in some ways, something that Anna knows much more about and maybe will even talk about uh, than I do. So professionalization. Simply loving something with all your heart doesn't actually make it tip-top. And also, inevitably, I suppose, a kind of cosmopolitanism. Crossing boundaries. I mentioned a historian like Hobsbawm. International history. A publisher like Weidenfeld, from Austria originally, very concerned to publish young writers who are now writing in German. Let's try and revive what... It's happening in that wonderful country now that Nazism's come and gone. And let's try and sell Spanish language editions of what that wonderful novelist from Vienna is doing so that the wider world knows about them. Cross-cultural, international. I think of the famous phrase um, by Isaac Deutscher, the historian who wrote about Trotsky and others, the non-Jewish Jew. The Jew who was archetypally... Jewish in the sense of, I'm a person of the entire world, the bags are always packed, the wandering Jew, I'm at home everywhere and nowhere, the world is my friends. There's something oddly enough Jewish, they would have argued, I remember Weidenfeld arguing this, about not being particularly limitedly Jewish. And that's a, something which I think applies very widely to some of the people we're talking about. Let me finish by saying they were very lucky to have escaped Nazism. They were also very lucky to have come to this country when they did. They weren't all welcomed, as Monica quite rightly said. There was anti-Semitism, xenophobia. We've had recession here. We don't need any more architects and all the rest of it. And yet, if they survived, and they survived the camps in the Isle of Man and elsewhere, life for creatives in London in particular, but Britain in general, in the later 1940s, into the 50s, into the 60s, was extraordinary. There was an arts council invented to put money into the arts. The third programme was invented just after the war, so as to put music and culture onto, onto the BBC, into broadcasting. This was the home of the recording industry. The London orchestras were thought, thought to be the best um, uh, sight readers, and the LP was invented not long afterwards. This was where the recordings went on. The Festival of Britain, which Harriet Atkinson has written about in the book, included the Royal Festival Hall, <clears throat> very much a modernist design building, largely done by Peter Morrow, who I think was born in Heidelberg. Um, and that put on wonderful concerts as part of the Festival of Britain. And from that day to this, I went to one only, only the other day. Um, so they were lucky to be here, and they were lucky historically and geographically. London suddenly becomes the centre of so many cultural activities, including music, because the great music centres of the past, Vienna, Berlin, Prague, Budapest, and so on, are destroyed, they're communised, they're the other side of the Iron Curtain. The jet plane developed in the 1960s means that New York's not so very far away, Americans come here... Anybody who can comes to London, which is one of the great, great cultural capitals, largely but by no means only, thanks to the people that we're here to talk about and who appear in the book. We are now talking at a time when that whole subject, which you and I remember, and I knew many of the people involved, has moved from memory into history. And as Monica quite rightly says, this year, 2019, 80th anniversary of the outbreak of World War II, kinder transport, the last of that generation, such as Monica's lovely mother, who I'm sorry couldn't be here tonight, in the 90s or whatever, xenophobia, obsession with Europeans, whether, whom we should keep out. It's a very, very currently relevant topic. Bravo to Monica for developing the festival and for editing the book.
bravo to, to London Humphreys for publishing, which I think is an outstanding book, fabulously well illustrated. I've more, virtually overrun, which is the crime above all crime, so I'm now going to hand in the direction of my good friend Allah, who knows far more about a lot of this than I do. Thank you very much. <laughs> we should do is, without further ado, looking anxiously at the clock, hand over, you know, from Daniel, talking wonderfully, usefully about the general, you know, the, general the more contextualising material, to the specifics. Some well. specifics. <laughs> Can you hear me? Am I mic'd? Yes? It's such a rich topic, isn't it? It's absolutely impossible to, um, to restrict it, but I shall do my best. I've been given two heavyweight topics, design and art publishing, how to get through those in ten minutes. I'll do my best. Well, design is a completely modern concept, as you probably know. In Britain, we had the Industrial Revolution very early, and products were made, but there wasn't a designer. Somebody somewhere must have had a pencil and a piece of paper and jotted down something, uh, and it got made, and then they thought, oh, it doesn't look very good, it looks a bit plain, and then a bit of uh, decoration was added. Um, and um, the first products made in, in factories were a bit basic, then, of course, at the end of the 19th century, there was a reaction against this. There was the arts and crafts movement, William Morris saying, oh, what we need is to hark back to the Middle Ages. We need everything made by a craftsman from start to finish. That's much better for the craftsman and the customer. But, of course, it wasn't really a solution to the problem of, of mass production. Uh, in my research, I found that um, I've been doing some research into clothing factories in the emigres, and you may know the knitwear company Pringle. They make lovely jumpers. Their first designer came from Austria, sort of refugee, came in the 1930s. Before then, there had been no such thing as a designer. How did that come about? Well, Germany and Austria, too, came to industrialization much later. Uh, so this meant they had a completely different attitude. And at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a body set up called the Werkbund. And the whole purpose of this organization was to embrace the machine age and to create design. So, for example, typography, new typefaces for the mechanical presses, um, sleek, architecturally built uh, buildings uh, in which to house factories and so on. It was a completely new approach. Uh, it was to be functional. And if this sounds a bit like the Bauhaus, well, it was, in fact, the precursor to the Bauhaus school that has already been mentioned um, and which celebrates its centenary this year. But the Bauhaus uh, was not the only state-of-the-art art school in Germany. There was a rival called the Reimann Schule, also been mentioned, and there's a chapter in the book about it, the Reimann School. Now, this was a fiercely vocational college, but also state-of-the-art, and they trained people to work in film, photography, new subjects these were, window display, fashion illustration, and the students who came out were highly employable, especially the women. But the Rymans were Jewish, and you probably know about Aryanization during the Nazi period. Company owners were bullied into selling their uh, companies to a non-Jew, usually for a, a pitiful amount of money. And this is pretty much what happened to the Rymans. They were forced to sell up. But Albert Ryman was not to give up so easily, and in 1936 he came with his family to Britain and set up the Ryman School in Westminster in 1937. Now you might say, well, I don't know about any Ryman School in Westminster, and the reason you don't know about it probably is because the Luftwaffe bombed it to smithereens during the Blitz. So the building didn't survive, and alas, the school had to close after only a few years. But luckily for us, it wasn't just a building. There came from Berlin a whole cohort of teachers and students <coughs> who were able to carry on the Ryman ethos. They taught Brits, they worked, and they carried on new... So they taught us new subjects, uh, new practices, and uh, an entirely new attitude to lots of subjects. Of course, Berlin wasn't the only place. There was also Vienna. Uh, many immigrants came from Vienna. They too had state-of-the-art schools for design and art. Probably the most famous is called the Kunstgewerbeschule, um, where people, you may know the, the potter Lucy Rie, she trained there, 
uh, and also an interesting textile designer called Jacqueline Groag. She came from Czechoslovakia and she came to study at the, I shall call it the KGS, in case you don't like the long <laughs> Kunstgewerbeschule. So the Wiener Werkstätte was connected to this school. You may know it, it's similar to sort of Rennie Mackintosh, that style, we associate it with Klimt. Uh, and you can see elements of this design in her work, but she also brought to it something of her Czech folkloric traditions as well. And she was extremely successful, so much so that as soon as she graduated, she went to Paris and Parisian couturiers like Chanel, Lanvin, and also Schiaparelli bought her designs. So she very quickly made a name for herself, which made it much easier. And she, uh, her husband, who was Jewish like her, uh, they hung on as long as they could. They went to, from Vienna, they went to Prague, but no, by the end of the 30s, they had to come to Britain. And she was able very quickly to re-establish herself because of her uh, existing reputation. And some people say that in the textiles of Lucien Day, if you know her work, 1950s textile designer, you can see the influence of Jacqueline Groag. So, of course, it wasn't just textile designers, graphic designers. Now, during the wartime, the émigré graphic designers were in great demand. And here it didn't matter if their English wasn't faultless because they had a visual language. It was immediately obvious. So people like Hans Schläger could tell us to dig for victory, grow our own, be careful in the blackout. And they didn't need a lot of text. They had, uh, Daniel mentioned professionalization. Well, this is something which certainly had happened earlier in graphic design in Germany. Um, there wasn't just Hans Schläger from Austria. We had somebody called Otto Neurath. He developed a wonderful system of pictorial statistics known as isotypes. So instead of having um, a graph or numbers, he used a little figure of a person to represent so many tens of thousands. So, for example, if the government wanted to show that you must be inoculated against the disease, rather than just having the figures, he would have so many little people inoculated and so many people not and you could easily see the, uh, the trend who had survived and who hadn't. Uh, Otto Neurath was in great demand during the war. Now graphic designers uh, were also uh, and still are indeed uh, very useful to art publishing. She said segueing carefully into art publishing because you need graphic designers to do page design, to design typefaces and so on. And art publishing is one area in which uh, the emigres really made radical changes, not just in Britain, but to everywhere. Because before the likes of uh, Fiden, I'm sure you've heard of them, and Thames and Hudson, art books were actually incredibly expensive. Not just that, and I'm talking about Germany as well as Britain, they were very awkward and clunky. Clunky is really the word. So typically, you would have um, the text, a big densely printed black volume, and then you'd have the images in a completely different volume. So you would ha often have to have the, uh, both books open, and it was very unreadable, but mostly it was very expensive. Luckily for everybody, in 1923, in Vienna, two enterprising, or actually three, uh, initially three, um, chaps called Bela Horowitz and his school friend Ludwig Goldscheider created the company called Feiden. They didn't start off with art publishing, but they moved into it. Now, they embraced the new technology. For example, to reproduce the photographs that they needed, they used a new technique called photogravure. And we've already had mention of the picture post. They used it too. So if you know what the picture post photographs looked like, that's what it was like. So quite dark shadows, but a nice creamy texture. And it was particularly good for uh, reproducing photographs of sculpture. And the great thing about it was that you could literally print thousands and thousands of copies without any reduction at all in the quality of the image. So Bella Horowitz realized that he could print 10,000 copies of each title and overnight he could reduce the unit cost of each book 
overnight, pretty much, he democratized art books. Suddenly, they were affordable. And from Vienna, they were exported all over the world to Britain, where they cost no longer pounds or guineas, but shillings. Everybody could afford a Feynman art book. And um, before I move on to the, the content of the book, uh, to say then how Feynman ended up here. All of the, the two founders I mentioned were both Jewish, and of course anxiously in Vienna they could see uh, the risk that the, uh, the Nazis would invade Austria, which indeed they did in March 1938, and they thought, what on earth can we do? So they cooked up a very clever plan. They'd already been exporting to Britain, as I said, and they made an agreement with a very influential and important figure who was called Sir Stanley Unwin. And he was the head of a publishing company called George Allen and Unwin. Uh, and um, he was, um, well, I was going to say he was persuaded, but he didn't need any persuading because he was a great fan of Feynman books. Essentially, some money was passed to him with which he bought Feynman. Their, uh, thereby uh, sort of un-Aryanizing the company, so making it, um, well actually, yes, making it then belonging to non-Jews and uh, effectively Aryanizing it. So when the Nazis did march into the Feynman offices in March 1938 and tried to seize the company, they said, oh, I'm very sorry, it belongs to uh, a British person. And um, Feynman, the, the families, had all gone to London and they continued to produce Feynman books under the auspices of George Allen and Unwin, who then distributed the books for quite some time. Uh, I haven't really very got, got very much time to talk about the content, but it's been mentioned before. So um, it wasn't just the physical book that Feynman changed, but the texts were written by German and Austrian art historians, and we've already heard that art history wasn't really a, an academic subject in Britain, not really until the 1930s could you go to university and study art history, whereas it had been possible in Germany in the 1830s. So the scholarly, the discipline, and again Daniel's idea of professionalisation, uh, was very important. And it was with the coming of the Warburg Institute, uh, the great Renaissance art centre, uh, who brought their own scholars with them, notably Gombrich, that then this uh, discipline was disseminated out to other British scholars and would-be scholars. But ordinary people benefited too from, um, from the art historians because Ernst Gombrich, of course, is the one who wrote The Story of Art, published by Feiden in 1950. And it was this book which sold, I think to date it sold something like 8 million, about 8 million copies, and it's still in print, an absolutely wonderful book. And, of course, it made a fortune for Feiden, and it enabled them to go back to being independent from the British publisher. And many readers have benefited, of course. Now, Thames and Hudson uh, was founded uh, by two other emigres, one from Vienna, Walter Neurath, and his later wife, Eva Itzig, from Berlin. They worked together during the war for, on other publishing ventures and had seen that Britain needed decent art books. And they really built on the success of Feiden. They added colour photography to the mix and um, they introduced this wonderful series, The World of Art. You may know these books. Many generations of British uh, art students have benefited from them and others too, ordinary readers, uh, because the, uh, they were, Thames and Hudson always meant to publish for the ordinary reader. Uh, so much more I could say about them, but I will just say that there are still Neurats on the board of Thames and Hudson, which shows you that it's not a chapter, a closed chapter of history, but uh, still very much part of everyday life. So, for example, if you go out of King's Place, you look at the bus stops, those are still the bus stops that were designed by Hans Schläger. If you have a toaster at home that's made by a company called Duolit, well, you perhaps don't know, but the Duolits were created by a German refugee called Max Gordinsky. Uh, they changed their name. Duolit toasters are still being made, they're still trading, and they're hugely successful. So, I want to finish... Um, with one last person, because this was not so much a continuation of a company, but a relaunching of one. 
and it's Tibor Reich. Tibor Reich was a, uh, a young Jewish textile entrepreneur from Budapest who was sent by his parents to Vienna to study textile as one did. Well, unfortunately, of course, Vienna in the 1930s was no place for, for a, a Jewish student. He felt very uneasy and asked to leave, and he decamped instead to Leeds University, which happened to have a state-of-the-art textile department, and he did extremely well there. When he graduated, he set up his own little company just outside Stratford-on-Avon, and his first coup was to enter a competition. They were making, they were asking for samples of fabric for somebody called Princess Elizabeth. She was going to get married, and she needed to set up a home. And Tibor Reich uh, created this beautiful textured cream material with a very slight lurex sparkle, and she chose it. And uh, this was really, of course, the first step in the success of his company. He had so many achievements, one of which was uh, innovation. Um, he, he created, I don't know if you can see, but I brought a sample of his work along. He uh, used photography to, uh, this is just photographs of bits of straw, but he took photographs and cut them all up and printed them. So he used modern technology and he was uh, very innovative and curious about everything. And uh, one of his last successful projects was he designed the interior of the first Concorde. And I don't know if you were lucky enough to fly, but you would have been sitting on seats which were pink, orange, turquoise, purple, unimaginable now, but it was, uh, it was very glamorous. And he carried on trading until 1984, which for a British textile company is fairly a fairly long time. So many of them went under in the 1970s when there was uh, a lot of competition from the, from the Far East. But, luckily for us, his young grandson, Sam Reich, said, I'm going to relaunch Grandpa's company. And a few years ago, he did. And he is now uh, supplying these fabrics and others, um, some of them slightly rejigged for the 21st century, and if you go to Soho House, if you move in those circles, high-end hotels and clubs, the uh, upholstery and the fittings, soft fittings, will be from Tibor Designs. So really, just to reiterate the point, that this very much lives on, this is not past history, but very much part of everyday British life. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. Could we have the lights up so we can now open things up to the audience? Thank you. That's, that's better than I can see who I'm looking at. Um, good. Um, any questions? Any thoughts? Sure. Uh, actually, hold on. Do we need mic? Yes, just hold on a second. Make sure you hold it close here. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? You're fine, thank you. Uh, it's, it strikes me as a traditional Jew, but also somebody who loves the arts, that one of the things running all through these artists, lots of the, I know you can't generalise <coughs> everything, but they are aggressively secular. Think about Lucien Freud, Arbach, like Deutsche, non-Jewish Jew. What is it that, apart from the cosmopolitanism and, and the originality, what makes them Jewish in particular when so many are Jewish, but they're not Jewish and when you look at it from a traditional Jewish viewpoint, not not Jewish, but just traditional Jewish viewpoint from religious point of view. Um, could you would you like to comment on that at all? Mm. It's a good question. Um, you know, we know culturally, sociologically, that the vast majority of those who did come here, and it was partly to do with having the financial wherewithal to do so, let's let's face it, or the contacts, prior contacts to enable them to come to this country were assimilated, as Daniel quite rightly said, they were proud Germans or Austrians or whatever, perhaps first of the Jewish faith. Yes, their Jewishness didn't feature as the dominant aspect of their identity. Um, there is the other side of the coin, as it were, and it's something I'm quite interested in and don't know that much about. There were certain Yiddish speakers coming from a much more orthodox background who come in many cases to 1930s Whitechapel. Uh, for example, Avram Stencil, the poet, it's like manga, mostly poets in fact, um, about which very little research has been done. So I think that is a, another aspect that repays further scrutiny, but they are the minority. 
they are the minority. There are a few exceptions. I mean, for example, Ludwig Meidner, who we haven't mentioned, who was the most important expressionist painter in the early 20th century. He um, actually, interestingly enough, he's not particularly religious to begin with, but actually under the pressure of anti-Semitism and wartime circumstances, he becomes a very ardently orthodox Jew, and he starts producing works relating quite closely to the Holocaust and his awareness of it. So there are exceptions, but I'm glad you mentioned that, because I think you know, it is part of the story. It's part of the story. <clears throat> I mean, some of them were orthodox Jews. Um, you know, one of them became a, a chief rabbi here, <laughs> Jacobowitz, for example. But uh, Monica's quite right. I mean, in general, they were not... Jewish conscious in a religious sense, but you could say sociologically, historically, Jews tended to be from families where education was uh, a good way of climbing up the social ladder. You know, the rabbi was a teacher more than a theologian, and education was a way of climbing up a social ladder at a time and in places, the Habsburg Empire and so on, where other forms of social mobility, the church, the, the diplomacy, the army, and so on, were not available to people of Jewish background. So in that sense, I think many of them were Jewish, but not in a, for the most part, not, but not all, in a strictly religious sense. I think you're right. Okay, any questions? I don't believe there are any questions. <laughs> Too big a subject. Not possible. <laughs> I hope, you know, we've given you a sense of the richness of the cultural terrain. Does nobody have anything else they would like to ask or say? Yes, there's a gentleman over here. Uh, I think the uh, professionalism is certainly one aspect of what uh, this group of gifted and highly educated uh, German Austrian Jews who came to this country brought. But they were also in a position to rethink their world because the world they had lived in was shattered. And so I think, for instance, of the work done by Gombrich and by Elgogi Kerpis Kepes, the Hungarian Jewish, went to MIT, and Rudolf Arnheim, for instance, uh, through their work in perceptual psychology and rethinking the way we see the world around us. And those kinds of quantum changes probably were possible because of the extreme situation that they came out of and their need to rethink their world. Um, so I think that they go a little deeper than that. I think they do bring their institutions and education, but I think they rethink also yeah. the cultural milieu, and they do so from a radical vantage point. They bring a kind of radicalism in their thinking, and that is also, I think, deeply Jewish. I think you make a very good point that they didn't simply bring a culture from there and carry on doing it here. You know, in a way, two and two make five. Many of them wanted to go out of their way to understand Britain, be part of its culture, at the same time enrich it by something that they'd rethought by having to be migrants. So absolutely right, and I could give you countless examples of that, and I won't, but uh, maybe afterwards we can talk, because I think it's a very good point. No, no, I think you're absolutely right, and um, we haven't mentioned, of course, the post-1945, let's call it the Windrush generation for sake of convenience, you know, but other waves of immigration since the end of the Second World War, that whole notion of cultural hybridity, the breaking down of borders, all the rather trendy terms that <laughs> cultural historians mm. use. But I think in a way, they set the scene, don't they, for that, as you say, the rethinking of nationalism, patriotism, of definitions generally, breaking down of neat over neat categories and borders. I think you're absolutely right. Mm. And I think you want to... Yeah. No? I mean, some of them um, wanted to be very British, you know, I remember Martin Estlin, head of drama at BBC, born in Budapest. You know, when I came here, I wanted to learn to pretend that I understood cricket <laughs> and roll my umbrella and pretend I like milk in my tea. You know, but at the same time, he was responsible for, for helping develop Harold Pinter's work, for example, and also put Brecht on the radio on Radio Three. So they were integrating in a very creative way that only they could have done. 
And I mean, think about the overall title of the festival, of the book, Insider Stroke Outsiders. I mean, it is a, a concept that comes up, I think, almost everywhere you look when you actually hear the individuals themselves talking or being recorded. That sense of belonging and yet not belonging, which is, of course, a very fruitful tension to be dealing with. I think there was another hand. Is there a hand at the back there? Perhaps one last, one last question. <coughs> Thank you. And with that in mind, can you say something about your response to second and third generation? What was that? Repeat. So, uh, can you, can something you about responses to the second and third generation. It's a yes. big subject. We have little time <laughs> left. I'm happy to go on talking afterwards if you'd like to uh, pursue matters. But, um, yes, in a, in a nutshell, I mean, I've, I'm a second generation member. Um, I think growing up, I never quite realised what that meant, and that indeed there were many others like me, but in my um, work as a curator over the years, um, I, for example, in the 90s, I curated a show called Rubies and Rebels, which was looking at the uh, complex identity of artists who are both female and Jewish, grappling with issues of gender and of religion, stroke, ethnicity. Um, it's a complex legacy to be dealing with. Um, silence is often there at the core of an attempt to actually understand more, to come to terms with what your parents have gone through. But of course, once again, that very complexity makes for some very interesting art, and I speak as an art historian. Um, I have a number of friends and certainly uh, acquaintances as well who are, from that standpoint of coming after, if you like, yes, producing some very interesting, both very poignant but also very thought-provoking works of art in, in all media. So yes, it's an important aspect. And many of the people we've mentioned had their, I mean, we, for example, we were hearing all about Bella Horowitz, one of the founders of a, one of the great uh, publishing companies. His son, Joe Horowitz, still with us in his 90s, as a, had a wonderful career as a composer. I think I mentioned the conductor and composer Walter Goer, mm -hmm. his son, Alexander Goer, Sandy Goer, great composer of our time. And there's the Association of Jewish Refugees that moves on to the work and lives of the second and third generation. I'm going to end with a little feminist interjection there. I only discovered recently, you've got, as you say, you've got Walter Gurr, great composer, Alexander Gurr, the son, the, uh, the composer, actually, Walter Gurr was a conductor, wasn't he? Uh, Alexander, um, the um, composer, but what about Lelia Gurr? She was the wife of Walter, a very, very fine photographer. Who's heard of her? It's time to bring her out of the closet. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We're going to have to stop there. <laughs>